Well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Good? One person's doing well over there. That's great. Yeah, well, my name is JD. I am a volunteer on the teaching team, for those of you who don't know me. And it is always truly an honor. It is truly a privilege to stand up here and to look out and see all of your beautiful faces and to share with you. So thank you. It's, it's an honor to be here. We are today wrapping up our series on Jonah. Has anyone been enjoying the sermon series so far on Jonah as we've been walking through this? Yeah, I have loved this. This has been really good. We've been going through it chapter by chapter. And today we are going to be wrapping it up as we hit Jonah chapter 4. And I'm particularly excited about this because this is actually one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture. That when I heard we were doing the series on Jonah, Nick and I were talking about it. I said, are we going to do the whole thing? Like, are we going to actually go through Jonah 4? And he was like, yeah, man, we're going through chapter. We're going to do every every chapter. And I was like, wow, that is one of my favorite chapters. If you would have me for it, I would love to take Jonah 4. And Nick kind of looked at me like, you know, cross-eyed a little bit for a minute, kind of like, Jonah 4 is one of your favorite chapters in all of Scripture. Because it's a chapter most people don't even know exists. Um, and, and it is so bizarre, you're going to find it is completely unpredictable, totally unexpected, and it is absolutely brilliant. We are looking at an, a true masterpiece today. So I am really excited to be walking through this with you. Let me catch you up on kind of where we've been in the story, and then we're going to launch into this thing, okay? So Jonah, the story started, he is a prophet. He's called by God to go preach to the Ninevites. But Jonah didn't want to go do that. We've been making some guesses as to why that was. Uh, Our top guess has been that he didn't like the Ninevites because they were the enemies of his people and they were particularly brutal. And so instead of going to preach to the Ninevites, he goes in the opposite direction and flees to a place called Tarshish. However, on the way out there, his boat is overwhelmed by a storm. Jonah's thrown overboard. He's swallowed by this great fish. And he prays what seems to be a prayer of repentance from the belly of this fish, at which point he is vomited out. He eventually uh, accepts his call. He goes to Nineveh and he preaches what is probably the most successful sermon in the history of humanity, that he utters five words in the Hebrew language and the entire city comes to repentance, including the king who puts on sackcloth and the whole city turns toward God. And that's the end of the story, right? That's where most of us understand. And that's where the children's versions of this uh, story, if you've ever read it in a children's Bible, that's where it ends. And most people don't even know there is a chapter four. But that's what we're going to dive into today, where we find Jonah sitting under this strange plant and throwing a temper tantrum, essentially, about the character of God. So Rather than give you any commentary about this up front, what I want to do is I just want to read this to you in its entirety so you can just experience it in all of its glory, and then we're going to start to just break it down line by line. Does that sound good? So if you have a Bible, a physical Bible, that's great. Please open that up. We're going to read this thing pretty closely today, and I'm going to be referring back to it. I'm going to be asking you questions as we go, and I actually appreciate when you respond to the questions. These are not rhetorical questions today. So, Or if you have a Bible, fire it up on a phone or something, because we're going to refer back to it several times. All right, so Jonah chapter 4, here's what it says. But to Jonah, this, meaning the salvation of the Ninevites, seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right? for you to be angry? But Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die 
than to live. <clears throat> but God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I am so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you didn't tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? in which there are more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So bizarre, right? It's like Jonah's throwing this temper tantrum, and then there's a plant and a worm and an east wind and the sun. There's a lot of stuff that's happening here. So what we're going to do is we're just going to walk through this and see what kind of treasures we can uncover as we do. Okay, you ready for this? All right, let's do it. So at the beginning, it says that all of this seemed wrong. The salvation of the Ninevites seemed wrong. I think that's an important word because it wasn't just that Jonah was inconvenienced by it. It wasn't just that he didn't like the Ninevites, but it seemed downright wrong to him. It conflicted with his sense of justice And so he's feeling angry. And this leads him to finally open up and say why he didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place, which we've been making our best guesses about that up until now. We've been sort of guessing that it was that he didn't like the Ninevites. They were his enemies. They were a brutal people. And it turns out that we're actually only partly right in our guess. Because look carefully at what he says. He actually never mentions the Ninevites. He never uses that word. So he's not pointing the finger at them directly, but who does he point the finger at? He squarely points it at someone else. Who's he point the finger at? He points the finger at God. He says, God, I knew this would happen because you, God, I know your character. You're gracious and you're compassionate. You relent in in sending calamity. You're slow to anger. God, I know that you're a dirty, rotten forgiver. (laughs) And I knew this would happen. This is why I didn't want to go. So take my life. I'm ready to die because of this. But notice how God responds. I love God's response to him. So look carefully at what God says. He doesn't lecture Jonah. He doesn't condemn Jonah. But what does he do? Look carefully. What kind of statement does he make to Jonah? It's a question. Isn't that so brilliant? God just asks him a question. And it's a very revealing kind of question, right? He's just sort of holding a mirror up for Jonah. And he's like, Jonah, this is what I see in you. I see that there's a lot of anger to you right now. Is this good? Is this right? Is it helpful for you to have this anger to you? But notice what Jonah does in response. It's actually a non-response, right? He doesn't say anything. He ignores the question of God. And instead he goes and he does something. So look carefully at what he does and where he goes. So he goes outside the city And specifically, in what direction does he go? East. He goes to the east. And then it's going to start getting really weird here really fast. So he goes and decides to build a shelter, which is like super weird, right? Like that wouldn't be the thing that I would choose to do, to go build a shelter. So what I need to do is to begin to make sense of what's going to happen, I need to call time out on the story. And I'd like to talk about a few tools for interpreting the Hebrew Bible, because we're going to need a little bit of a tool belt to make sense of what's going to happen next. So can you hang with me for a couple minutes? We're going to build out a little tool belt, and then we're going to take some of those things. We're going to apply them to this story. We're going to kind of put them to use as we read the last two paragraphs of this. Does that sound okay to you? All right. So I've got three things I want to make clear about the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, as we call it. Um, And the first is that It is a very different kind of communication than what we are used to. And some scholars, they will refer to the Hebrew scriptures as meditation literature. And so here's what I mean when I say that, is that there are deep eternal truths that are embedded in these stories, but they are communicated in a very different way than what we're used to, because we live in a world where we want the TLDR version of things. Anyone know this phrase? I just learned this phrase recently. It's, it's another one of the things that the kids these days are saying, like I'm trying to keep up with, but you know the TLDR version? Anyone know what this is? Too long, didn't read. I just learned this. When I was growing up, we called this the Cliff Notes version. But it's sort of like, take this big thing. I don't want to actually work through this thing, but can you summarize it down for me? Can you 
give me a few bullet points and I'll just kind of take that with me. Give me the TLDR version. And I think if we're often, or if we're honest, we often read scripture that way too. That it's like, I don't really want to work through a whole letter from Paul and like understand who it was written to, what the problem was that they're trying to address and like how this thing holds together as, a, as one literary unit. But I'd rather just mine it for a few inspiring quotes. And then I can memorize those and take those with me through the day. And that's often how we read scripture. And that's not bad. Like there's, there's definitely value to that. But if that's the only way that we read scripture, we often miss some of these deep things that are embedded into that. And the Hebrew scriptures, they recognize that and they are inviting us into actually a journey of a lifetime of reflecting and meditating and ruminating on these stories and really wrestling with them because some of them are strange and they're hard to understand. But it's inviting us into a journey of wrestling with these stories because what the Hebrew Bible recognizes is that there's something that happens in that process that doesn't happen with the TLDR version of things. Because what ends up happening is as we're wrestling with these stories, they begin to shape our imagination. That as we're, as we're reflecting on them over a lifetime, they become like the lens through which we see the world. And they begin to form us in a way that just, you know, the bullet points never will. So they're inviting us into this journey. Okay, so that's point number one. The Bible is meditation literature. The second thing is a tool or a strategy that the authors often use in this goal, which are repeated words and phrases. Okay, repeated words and phrases. The biblical authors do this all the time, especially in the Old Testament, that what they do is they will intentionally use a word or phrase that links back to like a previous story from the Old Testament. And it's a way that they're bringing them into communication with one another so that as we're reading, it's like, oh, that sounds familiar. That reminds me of this. And this is kind of like that. And it brings like a new layer of meaning or this reminds me of that. And it's like the opposite of that. If you, Jarrett, if you're in the room, I know you love it when I talk about English class. So you might have learned about this in English class growing up. It was called an allusion, not an illusion where it's like something that's, you know, not real and fake, but an A-L-L-U-S-I-O, an allusion, like a reference back to some other text or work of art. The biblical authors do this all the time. We're going to see a few of it at the end of this chapter. There's probably like 10 or 15. I'm going to highlight like three or four of them here that are particularly obvious. Um, okay, so repeated words and phrases. The last piece is that biblical authors don't waste words. So if there is something that you encounter that seems redundant or repetitive or like just a weird random detail, it is probably not a throwaway. Um, it is probably there for a very important purpose. And one of the things we, can, uh, we don't often appreciate from where we sit is how unbelievably expensive and laborious it was to write something 3,000 years ago. That the scrolls that these things were written on were unimaginably expensive, and very few people could read or write. So there was a special class of people who could read and write with this tremendous precision. And they'd write, if you've ever seen Hebrew, and I think we've got a picture we're going to put up of one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, these are some of the oldest manuscripts that we have of the Old Testament. But Hebrew is really strange. It's written right to left. It's these bizarre looking characters. But often there's no spaces between the words. There's very little punctuation. And so the idea is they're economizing space because it was so expensive expensive and so laborious to write this stuff. And the reason this is going to play into Jonah is that when we find something that seems repetitive or like a random detail, it's an invitation. It's an invitation to do further digging to see what really is going on with this because it's probably not just a throwaway. Okay, so this is our tool belt. Are we together so far? All right, so let's put this to use and let's see what's going on with Jonah. So Jonah is, is ignoring the question of God, and he's instead going to the east of the city, and he's building a shelter. So let's start with that detail of east. Like, that's weird that the author would have bothered to tell us to think it was important that Jonah's going east. So I wonder if that's a loaded phrase in the Hebrew scriptures that might link back, that might connect with some other concept, and it turns out that it does. And when we do this work, we often think about going to some of the most formative stories in the Hebrew Bible, which one of those would, of course, be creation. And so here's a little Bible trivia for you. When Adam and Eve were banished from the garden after committing the first sin, does anyone know what direction they go? 
they go to the east. Very good. And then they have children, one of whom was Cain, the other was Abel, and Cain famously kills Abel, and then he heads in a direction after that. Anyone have a guess as to what direction he goes? He goes to the east. That's right. You're getting this. And so throughout the Hebrew Bible, this idea of heading east often carries this symbolism of like, we're getting farther and farther away from Eden. It's like things are getting worse and worse as we go. Um, And Eden, of course, is that place where like heaven and earth overlap, that God's presence dwells with people. They walk in the garden with him. It's like the idealized vision for humanity. So if we're reading this story through the lens of a faithful Israelite, we see, oh man, Jonah's heading east. That's not good. Okay, so the next thing he does is he builds this strange random shelter. And it's so random, it's an invitation for us to think, I wonder if that would have meant something to one of the original readers or hearers of this text. And it turns out that there would be a holiday in your calendar that shares the same word that this is for shelter. So the word for shelter is the word sukkah, S-U-C-C-O-T-H, in the Hebrew. And there is a festival that if there are any Bible nerds in here who've actually read your Old Testament, you might recognize this as the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. Is this familiar to any of you? Have you seen this when you work through the Feast of Tabernacles? This was a holiday where the Israelite people would come to the center of their city and they would build these little shelters, these tents, and they would live in them for seven days as they had a feast and celebrated the faithfulness of God to their people while they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. So this is a celebration holiday that would have rung a bell in your head. So you're probably listening to me like, well, what's the point? How does this connect with Jonah? Well, let's take a look at the the description that God gives when he's describing this festival for the first time to God's people, the Israelites. And here's what he says. So we'll put this up there. It says, be joyful at your festival. So like, have a good time. This is a reason to celebrate. I have been faithful to you. And then there's a dash and we're gonna get the attendee list. Okay, so this is God himself telling them who to invite to their festival. You, your sons and daughters, your servants, the Levites who are like the priestly class, the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your town. So did you get that second to last group there? The foreigners, the outsiders? Who does that sound a lot like? The Ninevites, right? So this is a festival where God's people are to, in community, build these shelters and celebrate his faithfulness together with the foreigners, the outsiders. And yet here we have Jonah in our story going to the east of the city in isolation, building his own shelter as he is presumably awaiting the destruction of the foreigners. So the author is, it's, it's like he's intentionally using the words and setting them up this way to say, Jonah's like our anti-hero here. Like we're seeing in Jonah the exact opposite of what we would expect and hope to see from a faithful Israelite. Okay, you with me so far? All right, great. So let's keep going. So Jonah builds this shelter, and the purpose of the shelter is for shade, right? So hold on to that. It's going to become important. But Jonah builds this shelter, and then God is about to provide several things to Jonah. And if you were here two weeks ago, it was Pastor Justin, who was a a speaker that came to visit us, and he talked about how meaningful that verb, that word was to him about the fish. Do you remember him talking about this, that he said, God provided this fish for Jonah. It was a means of salvation in God's mercy for him in that moment. You're going to find in the next three sentences, that same word is going to be used over and over and over again, and that is not an accident. So God's about to provide three things in a row to Jonah. And the first thing that he provides is a leafy plant. And so this, again, is really random and weird, right? So this leafy plant begins to grow up and over this shelter, this sukkah that Jonah is sitting in. And what's the purpose of this leafy plant? Shade, right? It's giving shade, which seems redundant. It seems repetitive. So let's look a little closer It's not just shade, it's shade to ease him from his discomfort, right? So that sounds a little redundant. And sometimes when that happens, it's this invitation to look deeper. One of the things I often do is to look at how do other translations render this? Like, how do they word this? And sometimes if there's a great discrepancy, like if there's a lot of variety between how these translations are showing that, it usually means that there's something going on in the original language. Often it means that there's like multiple layers of meaning. 
And we do this in English. Have you ever said one thing, but you kind of mean like two or three things at once, and it got, has these different shades of meaning? Every language has that, but they often don't translate. So if we could put those up, I, I just captured that phrase in other uh, translations. I thought this might be interesting. So the CSB says, to rescue him from his trouble. The New King James says, to deliver him from his misery. The ASV is the most interesting, totally different, right? To deliver him from his evil case, which doesn't seem even remotely like to... Um, uh, to deliver him from his discomfort. And then Young's literal says, to give deliverance to him from his affliction. So here's what's going on with this. Very literally what that phrase translates to is to rid him from his evil. The word discomfort that the NIV translates is actually the Hebrew word ra, which just means bad or evil. It's the same word from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. And so what's literally happening is there's like this double entendre play on words going on that the NIV chose to focus on the physical side that this, this plant is going to ease his discomfort. It's going to make him more comfortable with shade. But there's also this deeper meaning that these are trying to pull out that this plant is going to be like an object lesson for Jonah that God is going to use to hopefully deliver him from his evil, that darkness in his heart that longs to see calamity come upon his enemies. So there's actually a couple things going on at once. And how is he feeling about the plant? Let's just note that real quick. He's feeling very happy. So this is just to note the first and only time in the entire book that Jonah is said to be feeling happy. He was not happy to be swallowed by the fish and saved from death. He was not happy to be spit out of the fish and again saved from death. He was not happy when the Ninevites responded to his message and all came to salvation. But this plant, now we're talking. Jonah is very happy about this plant. Okay, so God's going to provide a few other things. So very next sentence, God provides a worm. And this worm comes and eats the plant. And then God provides something else. He provides an east wind. And so if we're getting the hang of this, if you're starting to see a pattern, like maybe we do some deeper digging. I wonder if east wind is like a loaded phrase that carries some, some kind of meaning. It turns out if we go to one of the other most formative texts in the Hebrew scriptures, which would be the Exodus, there are multiple references to this. So you might remember the 10 plagues that delivered the uh, Israelites out of Egypt, right? There was a plague of locusts. Anybody want to guess what kind of wind that plague of locusts came riding into town on? An east wind. And if you're still not convinced by this, the Israelites are wandering through the, or they're running through the desert after they've been released, and the Egyptian army is pursuing them. They're barreling down. It looks like all's going to be lost because they're trapped against the sea. There's nowhere for them to go, and the army is coming. And then God sends a wind to split the sea for safe passage for them to move safely ahead. Any guess what kind of wind it was that split the sea? It was an east wind. So this stuff is not, like, this is not an accident that, that this is the language that's used. This is very intentional to get us to think about this stuff because an east wind has the sense of being like a force of destruction for those who are opposed to the ways of God. But it also seems like for those who are God's people, it can be a source of salvation for them. And so for Jonah, what do we see the east wind does? Well, presumably it destroys his sukkah, his, his shelter, because it's nowhere to be found in the next verse. And all of a sudden the sun is beating down on his head and Jonah is upset. Take my life. I'm ready to go. I'm so angry about this. And it's right at that moment that God asks his second question to Jonah, which notice it is exactly word for word the same with just one little phrase difference at the end. So again, he's just holding that mirror up and he says, is it right? Is it good for you, Jonah, to be angry about the plant? But this time, Jonah doesn't ignore God. That plant is so important to him. He's, he's got some things to say. He doubles down. He's like, yes, it is so much so that I wish I were dead. And it's right then that God offers his final speech to Jonah, which is also, you'll notice, a question, three questions that he asks to Jonah. And I'll just point this out because it's so brilliant. It's so beautiful. This final speech from God is 39 words in the Hebrew language, which map perfectly onto Jonah's initial temper tantrum, which is also 39 words in the Hebrew language. And it is interspersed by two virtually identical questions that God asked to Jonah. So there's like this beautiful symmetry in how this thing has been arranged. And here's essentially what God says to Jonah. He's like, you know, Jonah, listen, you, you, 
cared a lot about this plan. Like it meant a lot to you. You had concern, you had compassion for it, but you didn't do anything for it, did you? Like you didn't plant it. You certainly didn't make it grow. You didn't water it, you didn't do anything, but it meant something to you. So should I not have compassion? Am I not allowed to have compassion on this great city of Nineveh where there are 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left? And that's another one of those phrases. Like, that's kind of a weird way to describe a people, right? So I wonder if there's like some, some symbolism inside of that. Well, it turns out that in the Old Testament, the Torah, God's instruction, his special revelation to God's people is often described, at least a couple times described as that which tells them when to turn to the right and to the left or to keep them from veering to the right, to the left, like to keep them on that straight path. And so in a sense, what what God is saying is, Jonah, these people are walking in darkness. Like they don't have the light of my law. You clearly do. You've been quoting it up and down and back and forth and side to side through this whole thing. Like you know inside and out my word. But these people don't. They're walking in darkness. Jonah, am I not allowed to have compassion on these people? And that's it. It's the end of the book. Right? And in some ways, it feels so unsatisfying to us, doesn't it? Because in our culture, we love like the pretty bow at the end of our stories, don't we? We're like the hero overcomes the villain, and then the hero returns home to great celebration, and that's the end of the story. But we just don't get that here. It's just this ambiguous question that's just left floating. How many of you, when you read this for the first time, I know I was like, I'm flipping the page. I'm like, where's the, like, that can't possibly be the end of it. Where's the rest of it? But I I actually think that's precisely the point, and it's absolutely brilliant. Because what's happening that the author is intentionally doing here is it's sort of like he's, he's holding up the mirror to us now. And he's looking at us, he's saying, it's your turn. What are you gonna do with this? He's inviting us into the story. How are you going to respond to this? Are you gonna be like Jonah? and harden your heart toward those that you feel like don't deserve God's mercy? Or are you going to celebrate the fact that God is a dirty, rotten forgiver, that he is gracious and slow to anger and compassionate, and he relents from sending calamity, and that nobody, and I mean nobody, is too far gone to be outside the reach of his mercy? And I think that can be hard for us sometimes, doesn't it? Isn't it? Because I think for a lot of us, there have been situations, things that we've seen in our lives that have been very hurtful. And we've seen things done to other people that, just like to Jonah, they feel downright wrong. And and I think this is, it's one of those things that for us, we feel like there have been things that we've seen that eyes should not see. And I know there are people in this room who've had things said to them that no ear should ever hear, or things that have been done to your body that no body should ever endure. But you see, the thing about forgiveness, the thing about mercy, is that that does not mean that that was okay. Not even a little bit. But there's a profound mystery that is embedded in this, and here's the mystery. So the mystery is that if you want to uproot the power of the evil, that was done to you, if you want to render it powerless and disarm it, to defeat it, that does not come through retribution. It does not come through revenge. But in this great mystery, this wonderful paradox, it only comes through forgiveness. Because if we continue to hold on to that animosity, that hardness of heart, the bitterness, that anger, It's like it still owns us. That thing still has a grip on us. It's still shaping and forming who we are. But when we learn and become able to release it through forgiveness, it's like we are uprooting. It's like we're rendering that thing powerless and we're defeating it. And and what it does is it actually enables us to be able to see again. 
Because that anger, that, that stuff that we carry, it actually renders us spiritually blind, just like it did for Jonah. Like if you look at Jonah, he is completely unaware, completely oblivious to what God is doing through this entire story. He can't see it. But make no mistake that the mission of God, the activity, the energy of God is one of redemption. It's one of restoration. It's one of taking broken things and and making them whole, of taking hard things and making them soft. And as best as I've been able to figure out after years of searching is that his favorite tool, his favorite strategy in that mission is mercy. It's forgiveness. And so the invitation from Jonah today is for us to become lovers of mercy. For us to become lovers of mercy, which is such an easy thing to say, isn't it? It's, it makes a great t-shirt. I've actually seen t-shirts that say, what does God require of us but to love mercy? It's a famous uh, verse from the Bible. It, it, it just rolls off the tongue. But I think what we miss with as easy as it is to say is how scandalous it actually is. It is truly scandalous to love it, to rejoice when someone doesn't get what they deserve, to love it when there's imbalance. Because there are times, I think if we're honest, that we feel just like Jonah, that we're ready to call down the judgment of God because something was done to us that maybe it was downright wrong. And maybe that's deserved. But the invitation from Jonah is for us to release our desire to wield the judgment of God as our own weapon because it is not our weapon to wield. And praise God that it's not, right? Like if you were to entrust the judgment of God to me, it would not go well. So the invitation from Jonah is for us to become lovers of mercy. And so I've been reflecting about all of this over the last couple of weeks as I've been preparing And I wanted to find a positive example of this for you because Jonah's like the inversion the whole way through. Like he's always the anti-hero in this. And I I kept asking the question, like, what does this look like today in the positive to see what this would actually take shape as? And I had a few ideas of things that I wanted to share with you. None of them were quite right. And then I stumbled across this article actually quite recently. And I want to say this is an article from one of my heroes. Uh, Her name's Heidi Baker. Uh, And she challenges me so profoundly in the way that she lives. She's a missionary in Mozambique. And I will say there's a little bit of PG-13 to this. I'm going to give it a little edit, but viewer discretion advised for families in the room. Here's what she writes. So she tells this story. She says, one of our pastors in Mozambique, Pastor Sithole, ministered the love of Jesus tirelessly in many villages day after day. He would walk and pray and pour out his life for love. This angered some people of another faith. They hated him for spreading the good news. So one day they came to his house and told him that he would no longer spread the name of Jesus. And so for the sake of the families in here, I'm going to summarize the next few sentences, but basically this man was killed in an extremely brutal fashion in front of his wife and his children. Now his cousin was named Pastor Suprisa, and he was one of the international directors of uh, the ministry that Heidi leads. And she says, the two of them had been very close. And together we cried and we prayed on the phone. And as we wept, we asked God what love looked like in this situation. And after we talked, Pastor Suprisa got in his truck and drove all day and all night with a huge sound system to the village where his cousin had been martyred. The police had caught one of the murderers. So when he got there, he asked for the murderer to be let out of jail. Next, he called the whole village together and he said these words. He said, you may cut off our tongues, but you will never stop us from speaking about this message of love. You may cut off our feet, but hundreds will run behind us. You may cut off our hands, but still we will cry, we love you, we love you, we love you. Because Jesus reached out his hands and he died for love. Pastor Suprisa shared this radical, ceaseless, endless love with the whole village and with the very man that had tortured and murdered his own 
cousin, and thousands of people from another faith bowed their knee to Jesus that very day because of love. And she reflects on this, and this is what she says. These are powerful words. She says, radical fruit can only flow out of a life of a radical life of obedient love and intimacy with Jesus. What would you do for love? Where would you go for love? What would you give for love's sake? Wholehearted lovers will do anything and pay any price. Nothing is too difficult for them because they are totally abandoned. Now, not all of us are called to die for Jesus, but all of us are called to live for him. And if even just one person reading this understands what I'm saying, they would become a nation shaker. And so I read that. It's a powerful story, right? And once I got past just the raw power of the story, it hit me that this is the inversion of Jonah. This is like the inversion of the inversion. And we see what the heart of God is actually like, that Pastor Suprisa could have lived in that animosity and that bondage, but instead he chose to release it and brought enormous blessing to both himself and to that village where thousands of people met Jesus that day because he became love embodied. He became mercy with skin on. And the other thing that struck me about this was just how embodied his response was. That what he didn't do, he didn't just pray with Heidi on the phone and be like, I have released my animosity, I have forgiven, I've attained inner enlightenment, and now I am free. Which he, he probably had to go through that process as they prayed together. But it led him into an embodied expression of what that meant. It, it led him to physically do something where he actually got in his car and actually drove back out to this village at great risk to himself, by the way, right? Like they could have done the exact same thing to him that they did to his cousin. But he went and he preached this message of forgiveness and grace and mercy and love and, and released revival in their town. And thousands of people, generations were changed because of it. And so as we come to the end of the series today, what I wanted to do was to, to take, a, take a page, take some inspiration from Pastor Suprisa. And if you remember at the very beginning of this series, Nick, when he was up here, he asked you to make a list in your phone of maybe some people that you have conflict. Some people maybe that you look at as too far gone. They're just, they're too far gone to be within the bounds of God's mercy. And he asked you to pray for those people. And so today, as we, as we reflect on Jonah and, and learn from the example of Pastor Suprisa, I'm wondering if we can take that one step further. So if you have your phone out, get that list back out. I want you to take a look at that list. And I wonder if God is asking us the same question that he asked Jonah so many years ago. That as you look at those names, I wonder if God is saying, should I not have compassion? Should I not have concern for these people? And I also wonder if God is stirring in some of you a physical response, something tangibly to do beyond just praying and, you know, emotionally releasing this stuff. But I wonder if there's a letter that you need to write. I wonder if there's a phone call or a text that you need to make. Or if there's a gift you need to send or a cup of coffee you need to have. I don't know what it looks like, but I wonder if God is stirring something like that in you for any of those folks. And so you won't hear me say this very much uh, from up here, but right now is one of those moments where the most spiritual and holy thing that you might need to do is to get your phone out and send a text. It's, and it's, it's not rude for you to get up right now and walk out into the lobby and to make a phone call because I'm learning about the power of what, of what I've heard called quick obedience. That for me, it's like when God stirs something, often I will meditate and ruminate and analyze it half to death for like a week. And then by the time I get back to it, it's like, what was I even thinking about? Or maybe it's too late and I've lost it. 
but there is a power in quick obedience that as God stirs these things in you to begin to walk in it because it is for your blessing. It is for your blessing. So I don't know what that looks like, but Maddie, I think, is gonna just play some soft music here for a little bit and give you a chance to respond as the Spirit leads with some of these relationships in your life. So I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna step down and you are free to respond. And seriously, if you wanna get up and move around, that's what this time is for, for you. So I'm gonna pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. I am just struck by how beautiful and wonderful it is that you are slow to anger and that you are gracious and compassionate, that you are slow, you relent in sending calamity. God, what a gift that we ourselves are children of mercy. And so God, would you make us merciful? And God, I ask even right now in this moment that with your spirit, you would stir creative ideas in this people, God, on how to embody mercy, how to embody love in those places where there is fracture, in those places where there is distance and conflict. God, would you put prophetic actions that we can do that would, that would point to you, God, as like a representation of who you are and of your heart in those most difficult places. And God, would you stir courage in these people to walk in that because it takes tremendous courage, God, to have intentionality in the face of conflict, to walk in forgiveness and mercy when everything in us often screams otherwise. But God, stir courage. Make us peacemakers, God, for blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called your children because when we are peacemakers, Lord, we reflect you so beautifully because it is your heart. So Jesus, we just, we love you. We thank you for your character. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy. And it's in your beautiful name that we pray. Amen.